Welcome back, everyone. Um, uh, uh, for our second talk this, this morning, uh, we're really delighted to welcome uh, Sentel back to Condensed Matter in the Cities. He reminds me that he came here, came to London in uh, 2010 for the very first uh, Condensed Matter in the Cities we held. Um, let me tell you a little bit about Sentel for those of you who don't know him. He was an undergraduate at IIT Kanpur and then he went on to do his graduate work at Yale University with Subir Sachdev. He was a postdoc at the ITP, now the KITP in Santa Barbara, uh, before joining MIT in 2001. Um, a little bit later, he spent two years at the Indian Institute of Science in Bangalore before returning to MIT in 2007. And what about his physics? Well, he's particularly known for his insights into the physics of strange metals, his work on quantum criticality and electron fractalization. Uh, and for those of you who don't know him, he's much loved for his wonderful booming voice that you'll hear in a moment and a great sense <laughs> of fun and humor. Uh, we're thrilled to have him here at Condensed Matter in the Cities. His first talk today is pedagogical. It's entitled Introduction to Neutral Fermi Surfaces in Electronic Matter. So please unmute your mic and let's welcome uh, Central to Condensed Matter in the Cities. Okay, great. And Central, you've got uh, uh, an hour plus 30 minutes for questions, which you can divide as you like. So we're looking forward to this. Well, thank you very much, Pierce, for that nice introduction. And thanks to Pierce and all the organizers of this uh, meeting. Uh, it's wonderful to see participants from all over the world. Uh, there's any silver lining with the uh, uh, lockdown, it is that uh, the product that as a scientist it's that the uh, uh, conferences and talks are now uh, much more widely accessible than they used to be before uh, so it's wonderful to see this huge participation okay so today i'm going to talk about uh, neutral fermi surfaces and electronic matter uh, so let's start with something that uh, all of you know about uh, that metals have fermi surfaces uh, clean metals have fermi surfaces in a free Fermi gas, the Fermi surface is the surface in momentum space that separates occupied from unoccupied electronic states. So if you look at the momentum distribution function, the occupation number of electrons in K space that jumps from one to zero at the Fermi surface. Now, uh, uh, an amazing thing that was established early on in solid state physics uh, in the 1950s was that even in an interacting uh, a fluid of electrons uh, described by Fermi liquid theory, that the concept of the Fermi surface is still sharp and it's defined in terms of the occupation number of the Landau quasi particles. And if you look at the electron occupation number itself, instead of being strictly one and then jumping, uh, it changes from uh, some number, it, it, it takes values uh, which are less than one, but then it uh, uh, for small momenta, but then it still has a sharp jump uh, at some uh, definite surface in momentum space, and then it continues beyond that at some non zero value. So, the location of this sharp jump is an operational definition of the Fermi surface in, a, in an interacting Fermi liquid. Now, we know that the low energy properties of metals are controlled by quasi particles near the Fermi surface. So, uh, the Fermi surface plays an absolutely you know, crucial role in specifying the ground state of the metal. We want to know what the shape and size of the Fermi surface is. And there's a lot of uh, effort that's usually expended by experimentalists in characterizing any metal to determine what the Fermi surface looks like. Okay. Uh, sorry, went in the opposite direction. Uh, now in contrast, if we think about insulators that we learn about in textbooks, insulators do not have Fermi surfaces. That's the thing that sharply uh, distinguishes them uh, in terms of the, uh, the characterization of the ground state from a metal. Uh, now, insulators, of course, can arise due to many different reasons. Uh, you could have a band insulator, which has a certain set of fully filled bands in the crystalline lattice. You could have Mott insulators that are driven by Coulomb attraction, or Anderson insulators that are driven by disorder, and in some cases, some combination of these effects. Okay? Uh, so, in the in modern condensed matter physics, 
amazingly enough, there have been a number of suggestions that certain insulating materials may have gapless aggregations that form a Fermi surface. Okay. Uh, now, insulators, of course, do not have mobile electric charges because otherwise they won't be insulating. So the presumed Fermi surface is that, is that of electrically neutral excitations. And this is what uh, uh, I and others call a neutral Fermi surface, right? So if there is an insulator which has uh, such a neutral Fermi surface, it will have many fascinating properties and which will reveal themselves in a variety of different experiments. So that, that insulator will be totally different uh, that kind of insulator would be totally different from the uh, familiar insulating phase of matter that we've gotten used to. Okay. So let me give you a brief uh, and very, very rough history of uh, where this uh, notion of a neutral Fermi surface in certain insulators uh, comes from. Uh, like with many novel ideas in modern condensed matter physics, it can be traced back to Phil Anderson uh, and uh, 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 working together with uh, Baskaran in the late 1980s in the context of, uh, uh, you know, uh, what was then the newly discovered high TC materials, uh, uh, they proposed that uh, there may be certain insulators uh, in which uh, there is a neutral Fermi surface. Uh, and th there's some very interesting early ideas in that period, and there's a lot of development in the late 1980s, early 1990s, in the context of tube plate theory. Uh, some of the names, a selection of uh, uh, people who contributed uh, is listed here. Uh, and uh, so that really is the beginnings of this notion. Uh, of course, there's a very, no uh, at that time, and even now, it's a very novel kind of concept. And uh, there's a lot of skepticism, and many, many theoretical questions have since been raised about whether this uh, uh, kind of phenomenon can happen at all and what its properties would be. And uh, several of those questions have uh, in the ensuing decades been satisfactorily answered. Though of course, like in any scientific topic, nothing is ever fully understood, but we've understood a great deal more. Um, so in the last 15 years, uh, there have been proposals that this kind of phenomenon may happen in a variety of other systems by many people, both theorists and experimentalists. Uh, uh, right now, uh, there's no serious notion that uh, in the original context of cuprate, of the cuprate materials, that uh, uh, this proposal of neutral Fermi surface really exists uh, uh, in the Morton slater. Uh, the Morton slater and the cuprates is, uh, is anti-ferromagnetically ordered and posted up, uh, almost certainly not exotic. But uh, in a number of other systems, uh, this uh, idea has taken hold as something that uh, people are seriously discussing. Okay, so some of the suggested systems are here. Uh, perhaps the most uh, 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 common place where one uh, uh, might expect uh, this kind of uh, phenomenon is in what may be called a weak Morton slater. So these are Morton slaters that are very close to the metal insulator transition. They're just barely on the insulating side of the Morton transition. Uh, for instance, you may be able to drive a more transition through pressure. Uh, the best examples, at least the examples which have gotten the most attention, are quasi two dimensional organic salts on uh, nearly triangular uh, uh, lattices. Uh, two of the famous examples of such materials are here. Uh, so, so these are long molecules that form uh, layered structures, and uh, the action takes place on a triangular lattice within each layer. Uh, more recently, there have been suggestions in some transition metal dichacrogenides, which are layered uh, 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 to, to the two-dimensional, uh, again, these are layered materials that all the action takes place in two-dimensional layers. Uh, uh, a good example where this has been proposed is 1T tantalum disulfide. Uh, and in the last couple of years, uh, Condensed matter physics, uh, there's been a lot of interest in these so called Moiré materials that you create in graphene and other 2D materials by forming long period Moiré structures. And there's a very interesting possibility that these 2D correlated Moiré materials may well be uh, ideal platforms to for this kind of physics. Uh, a, a different 
variety of systems where this has been discussed quite a bit. Uh, uh, again, the last few years is a mixed balance insulators like uh, the terbium boron 12 and samarium hexaboride. Uh, and finally, uh, there's a class of materials which are also Morton slaters, but they're distinct from these weak Morton slaters in that they're strong Morton slaters. The charge gap is big. They're far away from any metal insulator transition. And uh, they, they may be strongly spin orbit coupled as well. A, a couple of examples uh, that have uh, uh, been mentioned in the literature are here. Uh, now, so, so these uh, kinds of strong Morton slaters, perhaps of strong spin orbit coupling, also being suggested to be systems in which perhaps you see this phenomenon of a Fermi surface in an insulator. Okay. Um, now, I should say right away that uh, 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 a caveat with this is that uh, despite all these uh, suggestions, it's currently not established in any of these suggested systems uh, in a very convincing way that uh, they do have such a neutral form of surface. So all the proposals, all the proposed systems are controversial, right? Uh, but, you know, um, it's interesting that they're being discussed in the context of specific experimental systems. So it's a tremendous amount of engagement between the experimental community and the theoretical community on the possibility uh, uh, that uh, so these insulators may have such a neutral from its surface. So it seems it seemed to me that this was a, a, a very ripe moment to review uh, some of the basic questions in the theory of the state of quantum matter uh, and to talk about uh, you know, what we need to do moving forward uh, uh, to establish in any of these systems the presence of such a Fermi surface in an insulator. Right. To talk about methods of detection and, uh, 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 you know, how, how can the field move forward to resolve some of these controversies? Okay. Um, so I should also say that, uh, you know, as the organizers suggested, uh, uh, it, most of this talk will be, uh, actually this first talk will be almost entirely a review of uh, things that have been known for a while. Uh, that's some of it uh, uh, maybe in the last two to couple of years. Uh, but nevertheless, uh, there'll be very little in what I'm going to say today that is absolutely new. Um, uh, so for the experts who are totally familiar with, uh, 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 with this topic, uh, you'll probably not find anything, uh, uh, um, anything that you'll not, probably not hear anything that you didn't know before. Uh, but nevertheless, what we do have at, in 2020 is the benefit of, uh, you know, a, a long period of engagement with this topic. So, we, so what I hope to give you is a somewhat modern perspective on uh, basic theoretical questions about the state of quantum matter. And then in the next talk, I'll talk about, uh, I'll focus specifically on the question of uh, the range of experiments that one could do in different systems to try and detect such a Fermi surface, right? And different systems admit different kinds of experiments. So it's, uh, it's good to have a number of different ideas on how one might go about uh, establishing the presence or lack thereof of such a neutral Fermi surface in an insulator, okay? Uh, okay, so, uh, so we are interested in the possibility of this, uh, of a bulk uh, neutral from its surface in an electronic insulator. So some of the questions we can ask is first, you know, can such a thing exist at all? What are its physical properties? What is the mechanism that will stabilize such a state of matter? And how will we detect such a state of matter? Okay. Uh, now in condensed matter physics, we should remember that in electronic condensed matter physics and solid state physics, we should remember that our microscopic description is non-negotiable. So we all we have are interacting electrons and phonons, right? Uh, now, so what we are really seeking is a situation in which starting from this high energy description, the uh, UV description, we go to the low, low energy theory, the IR description of the system, and we end up with an insulator which has this neutral Fermi surface, right? 
so, so that really is the is the question. So in today's talk, I'm going to focus on the first set of questions, uh, mostly whether they can exist and uh, uh, whether this phenomenon can happen at all and what a mechanism might be. And uh, my next talk is two days from now on Friday. And there I hope to focus on, this, uh, on uh, the various ideas that exist in the literature on how to detect such a form of surface. Okay. Uh, okay, so let's start with some very simple but very powerful observations. Um, so the first uh, uh, observation is a confusion that often exists in the literature that uh, uh, I want to deal with right away. Uh, so there's two different kinds of objects that are called neutral fermions in kinetic matter physics. And uh, uh, the, the one thing that may be familiar, particularly in uh, 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 for people who have been following uh, uh, kinetic matter physics in the last few years, are Majorana fermions, which are a coherent superposition of electrons and holes. Right? So they're you know, linear combinations of electrons and holes which are created uh, by operators like this, C, the C dagger over root two. Uh, to form a coherent, for an excitation to be a coherent superposition of electrons and holes. So see, el electrons have charge uh, minus E and holes have charge plus E. To form a coherent superposition of states with different charge requires that, uh, that you're in a superconducting state. So for such a myron or fermion, the electrical charge is not sharply defined. It's only the average electrical charge, the expectation value of the electrical charge that is zero. Okay. Uh, so this is this could be one meaning of the word neutral fermion, but it's not the meaning that I'm interested in in this talk, uh, because we're not interested in the superconducting state. Instead, we are going to be interested in insulating states, and in insulating states, when we seek neutral fermions, we are looking, you know, in an insulator, the a basic property of an insulator is that uh, the symmetry associated with charge conservation is not broken. Uh, so then we can label all excitations with their electric charge. So electric charge is a sharply defined quantum number uh, for the excited states in an insulator. So we're interested in an insulator, uh, 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 we're interested in emergent excitations with the sharp electric charge of zero. Not just that the average charge of the excitation, uh, the expectation value is zero, but that the, the excitation is an eigenstate of the charge operator. Uh, with eigenvalues zero. Okay, uh, so this uh, second possible uh, second meaning of the word neutral fermion is what uh, I'm interested in in this talk. Okay, so let's start with the obvious uh, with uh, uh, another with the most basic statement, which uh, which is why this entire phenomenon uh, may look a bit puzzling. Uh, so there's a simple microscopic constraint that uh, occurs to anyone who cares to think about this problem. Uh, so in any such uh, electronic many body system, uh, all local excitations must carry an integer charge n times e. Um, uh, incidentally, uh, uh, I uh, noticed that there was some chat question. I, I should, uh, it's a bit hard for me to multitask with chat questions. So if you don't mind, if you can just speak up during the talk, if you have a question, I'd be happy to take questions. Sorry, I have a question. Uh, uh, just asking for clarification. So, so, uh, so you say that the Majorana requires superconductivity. And in some cases, uh, the Majorana appears as a, as a representation of the speed, for example, in the Kitaya Honeycomb model. So there, obviously, it does not need a superconductivity. So right, very good. Can you please comment on this? Yes, so, so, so this kind of minor of fermion uh, is what, uh, you know, people have been seeking in, say, sort of superconductor nanostructures and things of that sort. Uh, so it's possible that when a neutral fermion emerges, there's an alternate kind, there's a more sophisticated story, which is what happens in the Kitai uh, honeycomb model, which is that there is a sharp, an excitation that emerges in an insulator that is a neutral fermion with sharp electric charge zero. Uh, but that excitation is itself has a further characterization as a minor fermion. Now that's, uh, 
a, a more delicate story. So, so that will be incorporated into uh, my second kind of uh, uh, neutral formula, right? While this one, which is what uh, you know, people search for when they take a sublimating nanowire and put it in, in a magnetic field and try to look for minor end states and so on. It's that kind that I'm not interested in. That kind is also called uh, a neutral fermion in the literature. Okay? Is that uh, no, that I didn't uh, get. So in the, in the Kitai honeycomb model, we use the Majorana representation of the spin, and then they, we get some Majorana bands and so on. So, so there is really number one and num number two. Even though no, 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 sorry. So, so, so what happens in the Kitai honeycomb model, the emergent fermions uh, belong to category two. They are they also have a Majorana character. So this is perhaps a bit confusing, uh, but they are really excitations with sharp electric charge zero. They're not the kind that exists uh, that, you know, the, 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 the say the Majorana end modes in a subunitor. They're not those, those types yes. of objects. They're very different types of objects and they, and they really belong to category two. Thank you. Sure. There's one other question. Um, uh, Gennady Titov raised the hand. Yeah. Could they un unmute themselves and ask their question? Yeah. Um, basically, since you already started about the uh, dual fermions, you're talking about Majorana and fermions, I'm just wondering if we just simply talk about uh, uh, Dirac, Jordan, Wigner fermions, are they classified as neutral fermions in, this, uh, in your analysis? Uh, uh, sorry, I didn't hear you. Can you? I'm talking, well, since you already started with Majorana ferments, in, like, like you mentioned, for instance, Kitai leather, which uh, you get them as in some sort of dual transformation. So I'm saying if if you instead have Jordan Wigner ferments, direct ferments, not Majorana ferments, direct ferments, are they classified also as neutral ferments in this scheme? Yes, absolutely. Because uh, in the 1D uh, XXX quantum spin chain or something, uh, you know, the electric charge is completely frozen, right? So that's an insulator. And all excitations uh, would be, uh, would have sharp electric charge of zero. So indeed. Um, yeah, we really need a different term for this thing that uh, uh, has been sought extensively in the last 10 years uh, in the Kenneth Matter physics. Uh, where people, whether in uh, subunitic nanowires or in 2D uh, subunitors, uh, you know, on the surface of a topological insulator, that, that, there is a different phenomenon that people are talking about, which uh, is in, inside a subunitic state, right? So that's really what I want to distinguish from these neutral fermions and insulators, okay? A question from Masaru Hongo. So, mm -hmm. a, quick, a quick question. That in the second example of the neutral fermion, the, do you assume that the, uh, there is no a global phase in U1 invariance, or do, do you still have the uh, U1 invariance, although it is charge neutral? Oh, so, the, the, no, so it's an insulator, so it preserves the global U1 symmetry associated with charge conservation. Mm -hmm. The neutral fermion is uh, expressed by the complex fermion field or the real, real Yeah, fermion? it will be. So uh, that, that, I, I, I'm going to answer that as we move, go along. So if you just wait for a few slides, that uh, mm -hmm. answer will be apparent in a few slides. Okay, thank you very much. Sure. Other questions? There's one more question that's appeared in the chat. Why do Majorana fermions require superconducting state? So, so this kind of Majorana fermion, which is a coherent superposition of electron and hole, right? Uh, if this is a short, an excitation of the system, right? So this excitation, so there's a sharp, there's an excited state in the system, which is a superposition of states with different electrical charge, right? Now, if, Electrical charge is a good quantum number in the system, uh, meaning the state preserves charge conservation symmetry. Then you should be able to label all excited states with that charge quantum number. So you can't make superpositions of states with different total charge. 
But this kind of myelin of fermion, which is a coherent superposition for electron and hole, violates that uh, uh, that uh, uh, restriction. And so it's only possible if you break the global U1 symmetry, which means that it's a sublimating state. Okay. I'm happy to discuss this in more detail uh, at the end of the talk. Uh, uh, people so desire. Great, there's no okay. further questions as far as I can see. All right, so let's move on then. Uh, so the, this is the microscopic change that local excitations carry integer charge n times z. So after all, microscopically, all we have are electrons. And furthermore, that uh, if n is odd, we have a fermion, uh, so n equals 1 is an electron, while if n is even, we, ha we have a boson, n equals 2, for instance, is a Cooper pair. So this constraint seems to rule out the possibility of neutral excitations that are not bosons, but that is actually correct. Uh, uh, what we learn uh, from this microscopic constraint, the key word here is local. What, the only thing that we learn is that neutral excitations that can be created locally are necessarily bosons. Okay. Uh, so, uh, which means that if we were to postulate that there's an emergent neutral fermion in the system, uh, we have to give up on the idea that all excitations are created locally. And we must allow for the possibility that some excitations, uh, even though they are excitation system, they cannot from the external world by locally perturbing the system in space. Okay. So, so what does it mean for an emerging neutral fermion in an electronic solid to not be a local object? So what it means is that if we have such a fermion at some point inside the sample, right? So suppose I manage to create such an excitation somewhere inside the sample then it must be possible to detect its presence at that point by doing experiments far away from that point of the sample. We don't, it should be possible to detect it without coming close to it, okay? Uh, so another way of saying it, which is uh, uh, somewhat more theoretical, is that this excitation does not have any natural description in the microscopic UV theory, uh, but we are postulating that it emerges in the low energy theory so we must find a way of hiding this excitation from the UV theory. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, so you could ask, uh, you know, how is it that you could have an excitation in a system that cannot be created locally? And uh, uh, this is an old story in Kenneth's kind of matter physics. After all, we are used by now to phenomena like the fractional quantum pole effect where we have all kinds of weird excitations, for instance, anion excitations, which also cannot be created locally. If you have a single anion in a, in a fractional quantum pole state, uh, you can detect its presence by as, by, as a matter of principle, doing some operation far away from where you created the anion. You simply create, take another anion far, far away and take it all around the first anion and see whether there's a braiding phase or not, right? Uh, so we are used in current matter physics by now to um, emergent excitations that are not local objects. Okay, so an emergent neutral fermion electronic solid must be something like, uh, which is uh, at, at some broad level, uh, something similar to the excitations in a fractional quantum Hall state, but it's uh, but also different in its own way. Okay. Uh, so in all these years of studying such segregation that cannot be created locally, uh, there's only one known way that uh, 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 we have to hide uh, the segregation from the microscopic uh, structure of the Hilbert space. And that is to couple the neutral fermion uh, to a dynamical emergent gauge field. Uh, so this is actually not a very complicated idea. Uh, and uh, uh, the reason this helps is that if it is true that the neutral fermion doesn't come by itself, but rather comes as part of a package where it's also coupled to an emergent gauge field. So then we can see 
how this is, will not be a local object. And the reason is that if we create neutral fermion, uh, it's also necessary to create the electric field lines of the emergent gauge field, okay? Uh, so in ordinary electromagnetism, uh, I think everybody knows that you cannot create a single isolated electric charge by itself uh, because you then violate Gauss's law, right? Gauss's law demands that when you create an electric charge, you also create electric field lines that go to infinity, right? So the process of creating an electric charge involves an infinitely non-local disturbance of the system because you have to create electric field lines that emanate from the charge and go off to infinity, right? So an electric charge in electromagnetism is not a local object. And so we'll just borrow that idea and say that uh, uh, we can create an emergent neutral fermion in a, in, a, in a solid so long as that neutral fermion is coupled to a dynamical emergent gauge field so that when we create this object, we're also creating these electric field lines that go off to infinity, okay? So then the next question is, uh, so what kind of gauge fields can we imagine uh, 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 that will do the job for us, right? Uh, so the simplest and best understood case is to just use something analogous to electromagnetism, uh, an emergent U1 gauge field. Uh, you could do something more complicated if you were wanted to be very fancy. Uh, you could go to theories with non abelian gauge groups and so on, but it turns out they all have some sort of instability, uh, at least in the spatial dimensions they're interested in, two or three dimensions. So the simplest, uh, 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 the simplest option uh, uh, is uh, basically also the most natural one. So in three dimensions for, or in two dimensions, uh, this then gives us a neutral from the surface. Uh, you know, if this, uh, neutral fermions form a Fermi surface. It gives the theory uh, of a neutral fermion Fermi surface uh, coupled to an emergent U1 gauge field in either two or three dimensions. Uh, so these very, very simple considerations sort of give us the general structure of a theory of an insulator uh, for which we want to postulate that there is a neutral Fermi surface. Now this theory uh, has been, this kind of theory has been studied for uh, decades and uh, many of its universal properties were actually known uh, at various levels of uh, rigor. Uh, I'll mention some of those as we go along. Uh, but before I do that, uh, let's ask about a different option, which too may be familiar to uh, some people, uh, which is, uh, you know, uh, why not use a discrete gauge field like a D2 gauge field or something? Uh, so it's definitely possible to construct states of matter, uh, uh, insulating states of matter, uh, with emerging neutral fermions, which form Fermi surfaces that are coupled to a discrete gauge field. But they seem, you know, they are much, they're somewhat unnatural to construct, even though it's possible to construct such states. Uh, there's a useful analogy uh, here. Uh, this is somewhat similar to the case of superconductors. Uh, where you could ask whether a superconductor can have a gapless remnant from the surface of bubbly bow quasi particles. And it's certainly a, a possibility that's allowed. There's nothing you know, prohibiting it. For instance, uh, um, you could have a superconductor, uh, that, you know, these days a very popular example is a uh, 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 finite momentum paired superconductor. Uh, uh, the FFLO state or uh, the PD, well, sometimes called the PDW state, uh, that does allow for a gap as in the Fermi surface. So it's allowed to happen in a superconductor, but most superconductors do not have such a Fermi surface, and it happens uh, rarely. Okay. Uh, so uh, another feature of uh, this possibility that you, to construct such a state using discrete gauge fields is that if we Think about three-dimensional materials. Uh, these states have loop-like excitations that carry the magnetic flux of this discrete gauge field. And there's a, a consequence of these loop-like excitations, uh, which is that these loops uh, can go from a phase in which they are costly, meaning they have line tension at low temperature, uh, uh, to a high temperature phase in which they're just swimming freely and they lost their line tension. 
And this leads to a finite temperature thermodynamic phase transition uh, that is potentially easily detectable through the specific heat and other such measurements. If you're thinking about three-dimensional materials and there's no evidence of such a phase transition, then we must discard this option in the, in the context of those materials. Anyway, so there's a number of different reasons why uh, the, the case of discrete gauge fields is a lot less uh, uh, natural to focus upon. And so I'm not going to talk about those at all in this talk. Uh, but it's possible to construct them and someday, uh, 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 you know, just like someday in the history of superconductors, we do talk about superconductors which have an informal surface. At some point in the future, uh, we, we may talk about uh, 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 neutral formal surfaces coupled with discrete gauge fields as an interesting uh, possibility. But the more natural states are ones in which they just coupled to uh, uh, continuous U1 gauge field. Okay. Uh, so those are very general uh, uh, ideas that sort of constrain uh, any phenological description of uh, such a neutral form of surface in an insulator, right? So they, so these kinds of arguments tell you that, uh, look, at first sight, this possibility may look crazy. At second sight, uh, it's not completely ruled out, uh, but the price you pay for postulating neutral form of surface in an insulator is that uh, it comes as part of a package in which you also have to postulate not just these emerging neutral fermions, but also emerging gauge fields. And so then you appeal for simplicity and naturality in saying that the simplest story is one in which these neutral fermions are coupled to an emerging U1 gauge field. Okay. So, real, so the next stage of theoretical question is how, how and might we simplify? Question from. Nandini, so maybe we can take that um, just now because you're know, sort of moving yeah. on to the yeah. section. Nandini, can you un unmute yourself? Yeah, uh, I was just going to say that uh, you talked about uh, discrete gauge theories in two dimensions as not being natural. And I thought if you could comment on the Kitaev model in 2D, which naturally gives Majorana's uh, couple to Z2 gauge fields. Oh, oh uh, give a Fermi good, surface. Good it gives you Dirac points. Right, good. So let me go to, I'm going in the wrong direction. Uh, oh, you can answer uh, it later if you'll come to it. That's fine. No, I seem to be going in the wrong direction <laughs> with my slides. So let's see the, uh, okay, good. So, so the statement that I made was not that the speed gauge fields are not natural in two dimensions or in three dimensions. Uh, the situations in which they are completely natural, uh, uh, but rather that Fermi surfaces of neutral fermions are not uh, natural, though they are definitely possible. Uh, uh, they, they, they can arise, they are allowed to arise, and indeed we have models in which they do arise. It's, it, uh, you know, if, if you're not worrying about microscopics that much, it's easy to construct models in which you can have a Fermi surface of these emergent neutral fermions, but uh, 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 it, it, it's just more, a bit more contrived than the case of an emergent Q1 gauge field, uh, if you're talking about a Fermi surface of these neutral fermions. Okay. okay. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, sure. All right. Uh, so those were sort of general sounding arguments, uh, but now let's ask, uh, how might we stabilize, how might nature stabilize such a neutral form of surface? Okay. So in the three classes of, situ in the three situations uh, that I mentioned before, uh, uh, there's, uh, you know, presumably the different mechanisms at play that uh, help stabilize these states. Uh, so the first case are these weak motor insulators uh, and the uh, states known as quantum spin liquids that might occur in these weak motor insulators. Uh, 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 so incidentally, I, I, I listened to Claudio Castellanovo's uh, nice introduction today to quantum spin liquids. Uh, uh, so in the context of weak motor insulators, I'll also be talking about quantum spin liquids, but from a actually rather different perspective uh, from uh, uh, Claudio's talk. 
uh, uh, particularly for younger people listening to both talks, uh, hopefully you'll be stimulated by the contrast and perspectives on uh, what's actually uh, broadly a similar state of matter, uh, uh, but in detail uh, is, is considerably different. Okay, so um, so this mixed balance insulators, uh, uh, there's a possible mechanism that is somewhat different uh, that I'll describe later. And finally, uh, the spin orbit coupled strong motor insulators, there's some evidence in numerical calculations of such uh, uh, of a uh, face with a neutral Fermi surface. Uh, but I don't have an intuitive understanding of uh, what's actually going on physics wise that stabilizes the state. It's seen in numerics. I believe these states can exist in this situation, but uh, I don't have good intuition on why they exist. Right? So that's, that's something to be understood in this uh, last possibility. Okay, so let's start with uh, the first uh, context, quantum spin liquids and weak motor insulators. Uh, uh, so very briefly, uh, let's talk about what happens to electron spins in a motor insulator. So most materials that have been studied so far uh, develop male antiferromagnetism that everybody knows. And there are interesting situations uh, in low dimension, uh, uh, they have more quantum fluctuations, or if you have geometrical frustration where you may beat nail magnetism and end up with states that preserve spin symmetry down to zero temperature. So such states of matter are known as quantum paramagnets because they stay paramagnetic down to zero temperature. Um, an example of a quantum paramagnet uh, is what's known as valence bone solid or in some of the old, earlier literature as a spin pile state, where there's a very simple state where there's an ordered pattern of such singlet valence bonds that uh, for instance, uh, on a square lattice will break lattice symmetry. And each spin is tied, bound into a spin singlet with the partner uh, tightly. And uh, so this state clearly serves spin rotation symmetry. It just breaks up into a lattice of singlets. Uh, and the ground state is smoothly connected to a band insulator. Uh, so this is a very simple kind of fire magnet. Uh, but in modern parlance, this is not what is called a quantum spin liquid. Uh, and it's uh, the simple state is seen in many model calculations and it's also seen in some materials, but this is not what I'm going to be interested in, right? Uh, uh, rather, uh, what's interesting for us are quantum spin liquid states and a rough definition is a quantum pyre magnet that does not break any symmetries. Uh, uh, but this is not a very good definition uh, this used to be the old definition, and we've, in modern times, we've learned to refine this quite a bit. And there's a better rough definition, which is as a motor insulator with a ground state that's not smoothly connected to the band insulator. Uh, uh, this is useful for some theoretical purposes, but it's not practical from uh, an experimental or uh, 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 point of view. And it's also not practical for many theoretical purposes. And the best definition that we have uh, is the motor insulator, which has uh, this notion of long range quantum entanglement in the ground state. Uh, uh, now, there's a great deal that still needs to be understood from, uh, from an experimental point of view on, what, uh, on how to uh, probe this long range quantum entanglement. So the best uh, uh, options that we have right now uh, uh, is to probe the, uh, the symptoms of this long range quantum entanglement, which is on its implications for the structural excitations in the quantum spin liquid ground state. Anyway, so there's a huge topic, uh, and uh, uh, I guess people who've been listening to all talks at this conference have heard talks from uh, Hide Takagi and from uh, Claudio uh, Hide Takagi yesterday and from Claudio earlier today. Uh, the one thing I want to say is that there's no such, there's no single quantum spin liquid phase, just like there's no single magnetic, mag, magnetically ordered state. It really refers to a huge and infinite class of phases. So what I want to do uh, in the next few slides is to describe a particular example of a quantum spin liquid state that is natural, uh, 
in the vicinity of the Mott metal insulator transition. Okay, so I want to describe, uh, provide you with a few different ways of thinking about this state. Uh, so let me start with a sort of uh, with one point of view, which is very physical, uh, uh, which is in terms of wave functions, and uh, uh, and let's see how to think about uh, 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 a punitive Mott insulator that's in the vicinity of uh, the Mott transition. So near the Mott transition, perhaps a good place to start with is, the, is to start with the metal. Uh, so a free Fermi, uh, a metal in the atoms of interactions is described by a slightly determinant wave function. Now an interacting Fermi liquid or Fermi fluid, we want to start incorporating correlations between the electrons. And there's an old way of incorporating correlations into the wave function for metal. And it's, it is to do it with a Jastrow factor uh, product like this, f of r i minus r g for all pairs of electrons. And this Jastrow factor tries to uh, penalize electrons that get too close to each other, right, in the, in the ground state wave function. There's a special case, so, so these wave functions are known as the state of Jastrow wave functions. They are used extensively in electronic structure studies. Uh, uh, now, a special case of the Slater Jastrow wave function is in a lattice Hubbard model, where we choose a particular extreme form of this Jastrow factor. Uh, 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 we simply say that on the lattice, if I and J refer to lattice sites, we choose if I J to be some G times delta IJ with G less than one, and this will break down uh, double occupancy of lattice sites. Okay, so the Slater Jastrow. Uh, uh, the Slater Jastrow wave function in this context uh, is known as the Gutzler wave function. It's a, again a popular wave function to incorporate correlations into a, into a metal. Uh, uh, so, the main point that I uh, want to make in this slide is uh, a point of view that is perhaps not common on this very familiar Slater Jastrow wave function. Okay? And the point of view is this. So the Slater determinant is an anti-symmetric function of all the electron spins and coordinates, while the Jastrow factor is a symmetric function of all the coordinates of the electrons. Right? So we can think of the Jastrow factor as a wave function of a boson fluid. Indeed, if you have a boson fluid, uh, a correlated boson fluid, its ground state wave function is well approximated by, purely a, by a pure Jastrow wave function. Okay? So by multiplying this anti-symmetric function with a purely symmetric function, the, the net the result is a purely anti-symmetric function, which of course is what we need for the ground state wave function for of an interact of for any wave function of an interacting Fermi system. Okay? So but really what we're doing is to multiply the free fermion wave function uh, by the wave function of a boson fluid. And the coordinates of these boson fluids are tied. To the coordinates of the electron uh, of the electron wave function, right? So we can say that the boson coordinates are slid to, to those of the electrons in this uh, boson wave function that we use to construct this correlated electron wave function out of the uncorrelated electron wave function. Okay. Uh, okay. Now, from this point of view, what should we do to get into a Morton slater? Okay. So there's a common sense thing that one can try to do. We take the wave function of this, bo of this boson, the Jastrow wave function of the boson, and replace it by the, by the wave function of a boson in Slater. Okay? So I should emphasize that uh, it's going the wrong direction. Uh, so the point really is that if we replace this Jastrow factor by any symmetric wave function, of the electron coordinates, they still get a legitimate wave function, uh, anti-symmetric wave function in the electron system. In the metallic state, the symmetric wave function is the ground state of a boson superfluid. Now, to construct a Mott insulator, we just replace this Jastrow factor by the wave function of a bosonic insulator to construct uh, uh, a wave function of an electronic insulator. Okay? Uh, so psi bi, the boson insulator wave function, suppresses charge fluctuations and enables us to construct a wave function of a boson insulator. Now in the e extreme case, uh, or, or again, specializing to the lattice suburb model, we remove all charge fluctuations completely 
And we replace the, uh, this Gutzler factor in the wave function by a Gutzler projection to know the blow occupancy to get a spin wave function. Okay? So the Gutzler projection of a slated determinant will give us a spin wave function. And it's some highly non trivial uh, uh, wave function for a spin system. Uh, and we might expect that the spin physics will be uh, somewhat similar to that of a metal with a Fermi surface, though it is a charge insulator. Okay, so there's a point of view on uh, how to think about uh, the evolution from a metal to a Morton slater in a correlated electron system. But, you know, at best, we might expect at this point of view, uh, if at all it captures the Morton slater, that it does so only in the close vicinity of the Morton transition. So there's a reason why we might expect that this kind of uh, wave function, uh, rather this more general kind, uh, to perhaps not to have some chance of describing ground state in the vicinity of the mode transition. Now clearly we can also play this game by replacing uh, the slated determinant with any uncorrelated free fermion wave function, for instance, BCS or something, and that will be a construction of a different kind of a spin liquid state. Okay, so let's formalize with this is motivation. So there's a, maybe a physical way of thinking about uh, the spin liquid. So let's put some uh, 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 meat into this. Uh, uh, let's convert this wave function point of view into a, uh, an effective theory point of view, an effective field theory point of view. Uh, so what we'll do is uh, uh, to use what's known as a slave particle framework. Uh, we imagine uh, taking the electron operator in the microscopic Hilbert space, uh, say on a lattice model, and fa uh, fractionalizing it into a product of a boson field, uh, which is often called a holon, and a fermion field, which is often called the spinon. Uh, and we imagine a state in which the spinon has formed a Fermi surface. And then if the boson condenses, we'll get a Fermi liquid, because if B has an expectation value, then there's no difference really between C and F. So if F forms a Fermi surface, C forms a Fermi surface. And really, uh, this is motivated by the observation that a slater jastro wave function describes the Fermi liquid. Uh, so the Fs uh, will have a wave function that's the slater part. And the B, when it forms a superfluid, uh, will have a wave function that's the jastro part. Okay? So from this point of view on the slater jastro wave function, uh, uh, we see immediately that to condense, can construct a Morton slater, we just make the B, uh, put the B into a gap state while retaining F into, uh, while keeping F forming a Fermi surface. Okay, so the energy effective theory will have uh, whatever we decide for the Fermi liquid and uh, for the fate of the boson, uh, we'll have a theory in terms of these B and F fields that are coupled to a fluctuating U and gauge field. And in this formulation, that fluctuating U1 gauge field comes about because this representation of the electron operator is, uh, is redundant, and we can make a local phase change of both F and B in opposite directions, and that leaves the electron operator invariant. Okay, so let me illustrate this with the lattice Hubbard model. Uh, uh, Just so, before you do that, there was a couple of questions. Yeah, sure. Um, so the first in the chat is, is the slave particle construction equivalent to assuming a separable form of the Jastrow factor? If so, what restrictions does it place on the resulting state? That's from Pavel Volkov. Oh, on a separable form of the Jastrow factor. Uh, you mean this product of F of R I minus all J, is that you mean? Uh, yes, uh, so I mean that F of R R I minus R J is equal to a product of F of R I and R J because because the the slave bosons carry only one um, position index and not two. Oh no no sorry. Uh, uh, so there's several answers to that question. So uh, uh, good. So at the simplest level, the wave function of any boson superfluid, right, is approximated. Uh, by the Jastro wave function, right? Not necessarily by a separable form. In fact, the separable form is not correct in general for a translation where in both fluid. You don't expect the separable form. Rather, uh, 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 it's just F of R i minus R j. 
Uh, but second, the slave particle framework is motivated by the slater jasper wave function, but it's a more general, uh, the, the slave particle framework is much more general and it actually leads you to an, uh, to an effective field theory with which you can calculate not just the ground state correlation, but also excited state properties and dynamics and things of that sort. And the wave function is, uh, uh, it's an approximate wave function within the slave particle framework. But it, so the JASCO uh, story is a motivation to ease the acceptance of the slave particle framework. The slave particle framework is more abstract, but it's more powerful, but uh, uh, I use data JASCO only as a way to motivate. And there's also a question from Yashar Komajani, if you want to unmute and ask. Yes, uh, actually, I just wanted again uh, to ask for clarification. So, uh, in in uh, in the previous slide, uh, the perspective that you uh, you you gave, it, it goes against the, this paper of orthogonal methods, right? Because uh, because the Fs do not carry a charge, and if they get localized, doesn't doesn't mean mod mod phase. So, I just wanted to you to clarify it as well. So, oh, very good. So, so that's a totally different slave particle scheme. Uh, uh, that does not indeed does not describe a, I mean that that's just a different construction of a different state of matter right yeah yeah so, but but so so when when b's get gapped uh, uh, and and f's are uh, essentially localized uh, mm -hmm. would you consider that a mod phrase and 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 why yes, would you, know, you do that because because the f's do not carry a charge anyway okay very good so so in this construction the state that we get is definitely a mod state, right? Uh, that, so, uh, um, if you if you wish, uh, I, I will give you a very detailed justification of that statement as we go along. Now, the case that you're thinking about is a bit; it, it's quite substantially different. Um, uh, it, so, in that case, the f fermions carry. Uh, uh, the physical excitations of that phase will be these uh, uh, F fermions and icing like slave bosons, uh, slave particles uh, that uh, separate away from the electrons. And those, uh, the excitation that form the Fermi surplus in that case carry electrical charge. So the orthogonal metal is a very different state gotcha, of matter. Gotcha. Okay, gotcha, gotcha. gotcha. Um, uh, they understand the relationship between this construction and the orthogonal metal, but that's a uh, topic for a different day. Uh, all right, other questions at this stage? Nope, that was it. All right, so let's go on. Um, so the lattice suburb model, we uh, uh, make such a construction. And uh, so when you do this, uh, the electron popping, uh, you know, now it becomes a more complicated object. It involves a product of two Bs and a product of two Fs. And we factorize that. Uh, we do a mean field theory in which we factorize it into, in, in this form, into a boson hopping expectation value uh, that multiplies the fermion hopping and a, a, a fermion hopping expectation value that multiplies the boson hopping, right? So, and, and the interaction, which is a Coulomb repulsion between the electrical charge, charge at site I, just becomes a boson boson interaction. So, in this way, in this mean field description, we generate some kinetic energy for the fermions, for the spinons, uh, some kinetic energy for the bosons, and the bosons have some repulsive interaction. Right? So, at the mean field level, we then map the problem into two separate parts. One is a free fermion hopping problem for the spinons and a boson Hubbard model for the bosons. Okay. Um, so that's what I've stated here. And uh, at the mean field level, uh, uh, if the effective boson hopping dominates over the boson repulsion, so then uh, the bosons will condense, so they'll go into superfluid phase and the boson kinetic energy dominates. And uh, following our earlier discussion, uh, this corresponds to the original problem to the standard Fermi liquid phase of the Hubbard model. On the other hand, we could envisage a situation in which the boson U, the on-site Hubbard repulsion dominates over this kinetic energy. 
in which case the bosons will form a molten insulator, where the fermions will continue to form a Fermi surface, and that will be a quantum spin liquid with a spin on Fermi surface. Okay, this then gives the mean field description of the proposed state of matter, which is a quantum spin liquid with an emergent Fermi surface of neutral fermions. Now, fluctuations must include a coupling to a U1 gauge field because its representation has a U1 redundancy. And so we end up with a low energy effective theory, which is a Fermi surface of spin ons plus a dynamical U1 gauge field, which is what I promised we would get uh, based on uh, uh, the very general arguments that I began the talk with. So, this insulating state that we constructed uh, is close to being a metal. You know, it's spin. Physics is almost that of a metal. Uh, it has a Fermi surface of a ghost Fermi surface of electrically neutral excitations, and the only difference with a metal is that the charge has gotten capped. Uh, so it's natural that it may be the ground state of a weak motor insulator, right? Uh, sorry, uh, something's happened here. I'm not sure what, but in any case, uh, it looks like. Maybe someone was annotating this. Uh, and actually, this uh, amazingly enough, this uh, sort of Mott insulator with a spin on Fermi surface admits a continuous quantum critical Mott transition to the Fermi liquid phase. You know, the Mott transition is usually first order in most circumstances, but this is one of those rare situations in which there is a continuous Mott transition between a metal and a, 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 a particular mort insulator, which is this kind of quantum spin liquid mort insulator with a, an emergent neutral from its surface. And furthermore, the critical theory of this mort transition turns out to be tractable, and there's all kinds of universal properties that one can calculate, uh, some of which I might mention in uh, Friday's talk. And it's, uh, I believe it uh, gives us a practical way of uh, accessing, of detecting the presence of uh, the spin liquid state in some kinds of in certain materials. Okay, uh, so it's useful to have a qualitative picture, you know, at the at a very crude level of the, the particular quantum spin liquid that I've described. Now I said it's good. I'm going to give you several different points of view on the spin liquid. So uh, this perhaps the most pictorial, most qualitative one. You know, the standard picture that we have from high school of what a metal is, is that there's a lattice of uh, uh, positively charged ions that is more or less uh, fixed in space. Then there's a mobile sea of electrons that are swimming around freely in this lattice. And this mobile sea of electrons is what enables the metal to conduct electricity. Now in this quantum spin liquid, what's happened is that uh, there's a phenomenon whereby the electron has lost its electric charge and only its electric charge. Every other attribute of the electron uh, stays uh, uh, intact. So the electric charge has been liberated from the electron, now sticks to the ion and neutralizes the ion. So instead of a lattice of positively charged ions, we now have a lattice of electrically neutral entities. And these ions and these uh, uh, electrons which have now been stripped of its of the electric charge. So these are the spin-ons. They are swimming around freely in this metal, and these spins form uh, these spin-ons form the Fermi surface. Okay. So the only thing that needs to happen to go from this metal to this insulator is this process by which the electron gets stripped of its electric charge, and that electric charge instead uh, attaches itself to the ions to neutralize them. Okay. So this picture, you know. Uh, it captures the essential physics of this phase, and it's actually something that I'll use again in Friday's talk in talking about a method of detecting. It, it, it gives us an idea for how to detect this phase in an experiment that uh, is very intuitive from, from this pictorial point of view. Okay. Uh, so there is some. Uh, we can ask uh, the, the next question to ask about is about the properties of this spin liquid. Uh, so for that, we need to understand what happens to a Fermi surface of uh, electrons when they are of of fermions 
when they are coupled to a dynamical U1 gauge field. And this is, a, uh, is an old topic, and there's a huge literature on this topic. Uh, 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 and much of this old literature uh, treated this problem within the random phase approximation and concluded that uh, these emergent quasiparticles, the uh, spinons or whatever neutral fermions you have, that even these will not, their low energy behavior will not be that of a Fermi liquid. Rather, it will be some kind of non Fermi liquid, but nevertheless with a sharp Fermi surface. Um, uh, and it's a hard theoretical problem. You know, the RPA is a, as an approximation. Uh, I believe it gives us the qualitatively right physics of this, uh, of the right low energy physics, but perhaps not quantitatively the right low energy physics. And there's no small parameter to make any approximations. Uh, so you can ask what really justifies the RPA. And it's a, you know, it's a hard problem in quantum field theory, which people have been thinking about for a long time and continues to this day. Uh, so one way in which people thought that this RPA could be justified was through a large n approximation, where you extend the number of flavors of uh, fermions to large n. But about 10 years back, it became clear that this large n uh, uh, expansion is not quite legitimate as it stands. And uh, around the same time, uh, there's a the solution that uh, some of us suggested as a way out of this large n expansion, which is to do a, some a more complicated thing is to combine large n with another small parameter uh, that uh, had been introduced several years before, which enables a controlled double expansion of uh, calculation of the physical properties. So this expansion is uh, controlled, uh, but it's not entirely uh, uh, satisfactory uh, because uh, what we needed to do, uh, what uh, was introduced in this uh, earlier, was to introduce some non-local coupling to the gauge field and perturb uh, in, in that non-locality. So, so there's theoretical questions that are still open, but overall, uh, there's a reasonable first draft of what the low energy physics should be. But for more detailed questions, uh, I think uh, 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 more detailed questions await you know, more serious development uh, uh, of this uh, solution to this hard quantum field theory problem. Okay, so uh, how am I doing on time? Uh, you're um, at five past 12, so we're sort of gradually segueing towards question time. Uh, you've been running for about an hour, uh, Central. Yeah, so I, I'm happy to stop here and take questions or speak for about five, 10 minutes more and then take questions. Either way is fine with me. Uh, I think five more, ten, five more minutes or so would be fine and then take questions. All right, very good. So let me uh, then quickly uh, spend a few minutes talking about, uh, that. So, so this is about as much as I'm going to say in today's talk about quantum spin liquids and weak Morton slaters. Over the years, I think a reasonable case has been made that there's a good place to look for both for quantum spin liquids, but also for a particular, this particular kind of quantum spin liquid with an emerging neutral from the surface. But next, I want to briefly talk about mixed balance insulators and describe a possible mechanism for the stabilization of a neutral Fermi surface through the formation of fermionic excitons uh, in such a system. Um, so a standard model to describe such mixed balance systems, I'm going to use the example of Samaria mixer boride, uh, which has been in, uh, uh, discussed as a possible material where such a state might arise. Whether it actually arises or not is uh, extremely controversial. There's all kinds of other issues that experimentalists are worrying about, about impurities and uh, things of that sort. But uh, nevertheless, we just use this as a, as a model. Uh, so there's a mixed valence system and samarium fluctuates between valence two and valence three. And at samarium two plus, you have full filling of a crystal free multiplet. And for samarium three plus, you have one F hole plus an electron in the conduction band. There's a similar story for materials like terbium boron 12. And a simplified model for this system is in terms of a periodic Anderson model, which has a weakly correlated 
say, D band or strongly correlated F, the narrow F band, some hybridization between the D and F bands. Uh, so I'm using a whole representation. So the, uh, uh, this hybridization looks like uh, D dagger F dagger. F dagger. Uh, uh, some Coulomb repulsion between the D electron and F electron and the non site uh, F electron repulsion. Uh, the largest term is the uh, correlations in the F band. Uh, so the system is in a strong correlation limit. And there's a standard treatment of uh, this kind of system that goes back to the 1980s by Pierce Coleman, uh, Nick Reed, and other people. Uh, and this idea and the treatment is based on the same. Uh, in fact, this is the first instance where the slave boson representation was used in current standard physics, uh, which is to fractionalize the F hole into a holon and a neutral fermion. And, uh, uh, and as uh, before, these things are both charged under an internal U1 gauge field. And uh, 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 in, in this context, in this representation, the average holon density is the same as the microscopic F hole density and it's the same as the average d electron density okay so so the picture i have in mind is that we fractionalize the f hole into a b hole on and a chi spin on and uh and the standard ground state described in the work from the 1980s was uh, uh, uh in terms of a state in which the hole ons both condense and this leads to the famous hybridization mean field theory of the periodic anderson model where the spin on and D electron hybridize to form renormalized bands. Okay. Uh, so we are interested now in situations where the whole on is not condensed. We want to get go beyond renormalized band theory. Right? But there's a problem. The whole ons are at finite density. So how can bosons at finite density not condense? Right? So that's uh, uh, the question. Uh, and the answer is that this uh, microscopically, we have the strong Coulomb repulsion in the F and D electrons. In the whole picture for the F band, this translates into an attraction between the F poles and the D electrons. And since in the slave boson representation, the charge is carried by the holons, this translates into an attraction between the bosonic holon and the D electron. Uh, so this attraction is strong enough then you can form electrically neutral fermionic excitations, uh, fermionic excitons, which are bound states of these two objects, which destroy the whole on condensate and hence the D electron from the surface. So there's a way of getting out of the, uh, uh, the standard denormalized band theory description. And we can get a variety of faces to this. Let me just say one more thing and then I'll stop. Uh, so to what we described as a way to deplete the slave boson condensate. Now, this mechanism is actually familiar from the physics of cold atoms where people wondered how you can ever deplete the Bose condensate of an ultra cold boson system. And it's known that this can happen if you have a Bose Fermi mixture with equal density of bosons and fermions. Uh, what you do is to form a molecule uh, between the boson uh, uh, the bosonic atom and the fermionic atom, and that molecule formation depletes uh, uh, the Bose condensate. And those fermionic molecules can form a Fermi surface and things of that sort. In our context, these fermionic excitons coupled to internal gauge fields uh, because they are the bound state of the slave boson and a D electron. And the low energy degrees of freedom for excitons and spinons coupled to a U1 gauge field. and since the exit on the finite density, they can form a neutral form of surface, and then we get a neutral form of surface state uh, in a mixed balance context. So let me, perhaps this is a good place to stop uh, and wait for questions. Okay. okay, very good, thank you. Let's first uh, thank the center for a great talk. We have questions coming up. Let's take the first one from, from Tamagna Hazra, who's got his hand up. Please unmute yourself. 
Hi. Uh, so uh, I was wondering if it's possible to talk at this stage about how we would uh, probe these uh, excitations experimentally in particular are, are, do there exist any probes of the size of these neutral fermi surfaces rather than just their presence and so if following up on that if, if there's an if there's a gauge field is there some understanding of what would analogous to a magnetic field what would turn these neutral excitations rather than just move them forward very good these are great questions uh, uh... Please come to my talk on Friday, where <laughs> the entire Friday talk is devoted precisely to answering this question. So today, I just wanted to review uh, uh, the theoretical understanding that exists of the state of matter. So that that was preparation mm -hmm. for Friday's talk, which was uh, that uh, Friday's talk. I really want to address to this question of how we're going to detect the space of matter, including detect the shape, size of the sperm itself as, you know, there's many, many aspects of this, such a state of matter that we might want to detect in experiments, right? And uh, what I'll review on Friday is uh, all the ideas that, I'll, I'll try to review as many of the ideas that exist uh, in the literature on how, how to go about detecting things. Okay, we've got quite a few questions coming up here. So the next one is from Jennifer Reed, if you could ask your question. Yes, thank you for the talk. I'm wondering if you can comment on how these kinds of neutral excitations would behave in an applied magnetic field. Uh, yes, I could comment on that. Uh, that also is going to be a topic for Friday. But let me just uh, say a few things now. Um, and it depends, the answer depends on which kind of realization one is talking about. Uh, so let me go back. So in the weak Morton Slater case, or uh, uh, let, let me talk specifically about the weak Morton Slater case. So the weak Morton Slater case, uh, uh, an, an external magnetic field. Uh, that uh, it turns out will lead to formation of Lando levels of this uh, neutral fermions. Now exactly how that comes about, I will explain on Friday. Uh, it, even though these are electrically neutral, it turns out that there is an orbital coupling of these neutral fermions to a, to a magnetic field that's applied perpendicular to the uh, the layers if your system is a 2D layered system, okay? And that then leads to potentially measurable effects in experiments. Now, you could ask about what happens if the magnetic field is, uh, and of course, there'll always be Zeeman coupling of the magnetic field. Uh, so if you apply a magnetic field within the layer, then there's only Zeeman coupling, right? Now, in these strong spin orbit coupled motor slaters, if they do go into such a state, which uh, in some circumstances they may not, um, the story is a bit different and it's not, uh, it's still being worked out exactly what happens. But uh, um, uh, there too, under some circumstances, it's possible that uh, uh, a magnetic field, irrespective of field orientation, can have an orbital effect. Good. Uh, next question from Yasha Komajani, who's got his hand up. You can unmute and go visible. Hello. Uh, I, I, uh, so going back to the pattern of rationalization that we use for the mixed balance regime. Uh, mm -hmm. So uh, I was uh, wondering, so two questions there. So one uh, question number one is that uh, uh, it looks like uh, it is a little bit arbitrary uh, which of these guys are carrying the electric charge of the external gauge field. Uh, oh, okay. I mean, I, I can give it to one to the, or the other and whether this is going to change anything. And the second question is, after you form your composite uh, fermions, so after B uh, formed the composite with a conduction electron, it still has to hybridize with a, with a chi. So what does that do? Oh, good, good. So, so the the first question is uh, uh, easy to answer. Uh, actually, both 
questions have easy answers. So, so the first, uh, 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 you know, when you try to do uh, start from the original model, indeed, it's true that it doesn't matter where you put the external electromagnetic charge. You can either put it in the boson or in the fermion. But, uh, you know, once you make a commitment uh, to a particular state of matter, uh, for instance, you describe a particular mean field uh, description, and then you build a low energy effective field theory, then uh, uh, the physical properties of that low energy effective, uh, the physical low energy properties are fixed by, you know, which state of matter uh, these bosons and fermions have settled into. There's, uh, you know, uh, the ambiguity of the representation does not translate into an ambiguity of the low energy physics once you made a commitment on what the bosons and fermions are doing at low well, energies. How, how can it be? Because, I mean, I can give alpha to the uh, charge to the B and then one minus alpha to chi. And then I can, in the, at the end of the calculation, everything has to be independent of the alpha, right? That's exactly. So the physics, the physics will be independent of the choice. But uh, um, uh, it, it really, it, I mean, if you don't do you any have to, approximation, if you don't do any approximation, I agree with you. But as soon as you decouple things, then you, things will start to be a little bit. Uh, I mean, it it could be that it goes wrong. Isn't isn't that? No, 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 not not at all. So, so let me, uh, the, the same issue arises even in the previous example. So let me go back to this uh, example. So even up here you could have had the same question that could put the external electric charge either in the boson or in the fermion or put, you know, alpha of the electric charge here and one minus alpha here, right? But once I commit uh, to a particular state in which I say that the bosons are either from, the, uh, let's say the bosons, are, uh, then the low energy physics is completely determined. It, it's independent of what alpha I choose. So in some sense, that's why I choose uh, in that description is it's a human choice, right? It has no bearing on the low energy physics at all. And, and indeed, I'm making an, an approximation. I'm solving the problem in mean field and then including fluctuations. The point is that if you take the low energy effective field theory of the state, which has this uh, object that are coupled to U1 gauge fields, it's true because it's a U1 gauge field. Uh, you know, there's a dynamical U1 gauge field that couples to both B and F. There's the external electromagnetic U1 gauge field that couples only to the B. Now you could say, look, I can transfer, I can shift, you know, little a, the dynamical gauge field by some, by any arbitrary amount that absorbs a part of the external big A. The question is whether any of the physical responses depend upon that choice. And clearly that, you know, from a path integral point of view, it, Clearly, no physical answer is going to depend on that choice. So you're just shifting some field that you're integrating over in some arbitrary way. So the answer is totally independent of that choice. Mm -hmm. um, and, and can you also comment on the second question? So uh, still, after you form the composite fermion, you need to uh, to hybridize it with the with the remaining chi uh, spin on that yes. is less, right? That's so what right. Does so that the, yeah, so the, that means that the complete fermions and uh, the complete excitons and the uh, spinons, uh, they mix with each other. They hybridize with each other. Yes. Right? But they're both electrically neutral anyway. Yes. Right? So that'll give me, uh, 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 that'll give me some band structure of these electrically neutral excitations, which could either form a semi-metal or form uh, an insulator. Thank you. Sure. Uh, let's see, we have a question on the chat, uh, which, let me see if I can find it here, actually more than one here. Um, where did it go to? Yang Wu, what is the criteria to distinguish between weak and strong MOT insulators? Is it the MOT gap size? Yeah, so that, uh, that is a reasonable criterion that, uh, um, yeah, from a, yeah, so, so if you could measure the mod gap, right, and the mod gap is small compared to microscopic scales, that would be a, uh, um, that, you know, that's one way to think about a, uh, weak mod insulator. Um, now, operationally, 
in most of the materials in which this kind of thing has been discussed, what people, the, the criteria that, that people use is to ask whether you can do something experimentally to drive the system through the mode transition, right? If you are able to drive it through the mode transition, then the idea is that it presumably uh, is going through a regime where it's a weak mode translator. But uh, the better definition is in terms of uh, the strength of the mode, the size of the mode gap related to microscopic energy scales. Good. Okay. And the next question is from Gautam uh, Nambia. Can you uh, unmute and, and go visible? Turn your video on, Gautam? Yeah, sure. Um, uh, yeah, I have a live question. Um, so uh, the slave particle de decomposition that we did was done at each site, right? But then uh, how, 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 from there, how can I see that the fermions are non-local? Right, so the non locality comes from the fact that this representation is a redundant representation, right? Mm -hmm. So there's a U1 gauge redundancy, which means uh -huh. that uh, you can rotate the phase of B and F at mm -hmm. each point, uh, each lattice site R, in some, mm -hmm. uh, uh, take B to uh, B times E to the I theta R, and F to F times E to the minus I theta R. But mm -hmm. theta R can be arbitrary at different lattice sites R. Uh -huh. so this gauge redundancy means that in any theory of this uh, that emerges from this description, the F fermions carry a gauge charge. Mm -hmm. So then we go, then there's a Gauss's law. Right? If I create an F fermion, I create electric field lines of the gauge beam, so it's no local object. I see, because of the electric field lines of, exactly. of the gauge field. I see, got it. Uh, can I ask one more question? If this go one? ahead, yes. Yeah, sure. Okay. Uh, so uh, you talked about the RPA uh, approach to uh, uh, spin on the Fermi surface, and you said it's uh, like some of the predictions are qualitatively right but quantitatively wrong. Could you like give an example or something as in what? Oh, okay, good. Um, um, yeah, so uh, let me maybe go back to that slide. Uh, in Three dimensions, uh, the, the modern understanding is that in three dimensional systems, the RPA treatment uh, gets the right universal low energy physics. But in two dimensions, uh, you know, the reason we're not sure that RPA gets the physics exactly correct is because uh, the naive way to justify RPA through the logic expansion we now know is uh, fraught with problems. Uh, now, if you do this controlled expansion, which has, uh, which combines large n with this other small parameter. So in the problem, which this controlled expansion actually solves, uh, you could do RPA and get out some results. Now you could also do this controlled expansion and then see to what extent the answers to this, this expansion match the RPA results. Mm -hmm. And at high order in this controlled expansion, there is a deviation from say, you know, there's a non-formal liquid state, so there's some universal exponents that characterize, uh, there's some universal, it's sort of like a critical point. There's some universal power law singularities at low energies. So some of those exponents have a deviation at high orders in this expansion. So an example, uh, since you asked about an example, an example is the structure of 2KF singularities in this okay. system, right? So the 2KF singularities in a Fermi liquid, in a 2D Fermi liquid, have some universal structure. Now, within RP, the RPA treatment of this known Fermi liquid, there'll, there'll be some prediction for the structure of the 2KF singularities. And when you calculate it within these uh, controlled calculations for whatever model they work for, you get deviations from RPA. But they happen at high orders of perturbation theory. So the qualitative structure is right, but the details of RPA perhaps not quite right. Okay. I see. Okay. There are some interesting questions on the chat here, maybe okay. which we can take um, on entanglement. So, from Chun Li Huang, um, you mentioned the best definition of quantum spin liquid has to do with long range entanglement. How does this concept appear in the slave boson formalism? And then uh, Xu Zhang wondered about a similar, similar question as to how it's characterized. Um, by the spin on Fermi surface, possibly? Uh, 
I got the first question. I'm not sure I got the second question. Let, let me maybe answer the first question first, and then the, maybe you can repost the second question to me. Mm -hmm. Sure, okay. yeah. Maybe we can just yeah. ask you going to unmute yourself later. All right, very good. So, so let's go to the first question. So how is the long range uh, quantum entanglement? Um, uh, uh, how is that a property or manifested in the spinon form surface state? Uh, you know, the very existence of non-local excitations is a symptom of uh, the long range quantum entanglement. Uh, uh, or, or the emergent gauge fields. Those are all symptoms of long range quantum entanglement. Um, um, yeah, so, you know, how can you have objects that can only be created by a global disturbance of the system uh, in a ground state where uh, uh, you have no broken symmetry or any such thing, right? It's because that there is no long range or right? It's because the ground state wave function has this uh, uh, global uh, quantum correlations, right? the quantum entanglement that enables you to create something that can only be that disturbs the entire system globally. Uh, so that may sound a bit vague. So let's. Uh, let me give you a more precise definition of the term long range quantum entanglement. Uh, uh, so you could ask about a state of matter, a ground state wave function, which has the property that uh, it can be smoothly deformed into a product wave function, right? Uh, into a totally unentangled product wave function, right? And the notion of smooth deformation can be stated precisely as following. We imagine that we, uh, we run the ground state wave function through a circuit of unitary gates, of local unitary gates, right? So then we ask whether such a local quantum circuit can disentangle the ground state wave function completely into a product wave function. Uh, now for the wave function of a Van Smoot solid state, that is definitely possible. While for the wave function of any quantum spin liquid state, that is definitely not possible, right? So uh, the, this is well known for gap quantum spin liquid states, which are characterized by terms of topological order and so on. Uh, uh, and I would argue that the gap quantum spin liquid states are somewhat, uh, from the point of view of entanglement, they're a bit more subtle than the gapless quantum spin liquid states that I'm focusing on which uh, clearly it's not going to be possible to disentangle the state by a, uh, by a local, by a you know, finite depth uh, unitary circuit. Yeah, that's the first answer to the first question. Uh, can the second question be re-asked? Um, uh, hi, maybe I can no. clarify my question. Sure. Uh, so I wonder, so you talk about long range entanglement, a calculate can, uh, from the whole wave function. So I wonder if we don't have access to the whole wave function, but we know some feature about the Fermi surface, will that provide some information to this entanglement? I mean, if we know that there is a spin system or any insulator which has uh, an emergent Fermi surface, you know, for reasons that I described, um, there's got to be long range quantum entanglement in the ground state. But I think maybe you're asking, you know, how should one characterize this long range quantum entanglement if we have some partial information about the ground state wave function? Is that what you're asking? Yeah. Yeah, I, I think similar. Um, yeah, so that's not clear. The best we can do is to look for symptoms of the long range quantum entanglement, which is in terms of these novel excitations and their physical properties. Right. Um, uh, everyone, um, we're approaching time and uh, we're going to have a student led discussion in 15 minutes. So I think. Unless we're going to run right through the 
the next 15 minutes, and I mean, we could do that. Uh, we're going to have to close off the questions for now. Maybe you'd like to join the discussion uh, in 15 minutes' time if you've still got a question. Can uh, I just ask? Can I just ask? How do you uh, ask a question? How I, I can get a picture of a hand, but it says clap. No, uh, you can raise a, you can raise your hand in the participants list. Uh, oh, in the participants list. Yes, that's it. Okay, it's too late now. Well, we've actually got six <laughs> raised hands. Actually, it's essentially done it incredibly well. But as the questions went on, the the list of questions started to grow faster than you asked answering them. Um, so uh, I think this would be a good point to actually make a make a halt. Central, will you be able to come to the student led discussion in fifteen minutes? Uh, at, uh, at, at least part of it. Yeah. Okay. I be able to come. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So if you want to hold those questions and bring them along to the discussion, it's going to be uh, run by uh, uh, Victor Drew and Touchette, uh, and it'll start in 15 minutes on this channel. Okay. Thank you, everyone else. Let's uh, thank uh, one more time Central for a great uh, talk and lots of discussion. Thank you all. And see you in